Okay, this is evolution lecture number one, uh, population genetics and the Hardy-Weinberg theory. Uh, before we start to talk about Hardy-Weinberg theory and population genetics, um, we need to get down some common vocabulary. So first of all, a population is any group of organisms of the same species that live in a particular location at the same time. They have to be in the same location and there at the same time so that they would be able to interbreed. So it's a breeding population in essence. A gene pool is a collection of genes for all of the traits in any population. An allele frequency is a, a percentage of a specific allele of a gene in a gene pool. And typically it's represented in decimal form rather than percentage form. So if it was 50%, the allele frequency would be represented with a 0.5. Uh, the genotypic frequency is the percentage of a specific genotype for a trait in a population. And um, you can calculate the genotypic frequency using allele frequencies, and sometimes you can actually go in the reverse if you have enough information. So genotypic frequency is based on the allele frequency. So typically, if you've got a um, if you're looking at one trait, you have homozygous dominant, heterozygous, and homozygous recessive. And if you add all of the uh, genotypic frequencies together, you'd end up with 100% um, or one, if you're thinking decimally. All right, so here's a, a, a sample gene pool. It's a very small gene pool, just to give you the idea. Um, but if you count, there would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 individuals in this gene pool. It's a very tiny gene pool. Um, but if you look at this gene pool, there are individuals that are either heterozygous, homozygous recessive, or homozygous dominant. So how many alleles do you have? Well, if you have 10 people, you have 20 alleles. Remember that everyone is diploid. If we separate them out, you end up with seven dominant alleles and 13 recessive alleles. So the allele frequency for the dominant allele would be 7 divided by 20, or 0.35. Be very careful because it is very common for students to take the dominant allele, the number of dominant alleles, and divide by the number of recessive alleles. But you have to divide by the total number of alleles. So 7 divided by 20 and not 7 divided by 13. Now, there are two ways to get the allele frequency for the recessive allele if you have the dominant allele. Um, one is that you could count them, just like we did with the other allele. 13 divided by 20 is 0.65. But if you notice, alleles are going to be either dominant or recessive. So if you know that the allele frequency for the dominant allele is 0.35, you could take 1 minus 0.35 and get 0.65. So whichever method you prefer, as long as you show your work. So evolution is a change in allele frequencies in a population over time. Uh, genetic equilibrium is when a population um, has allele frequencies that do not change from generation to generation. We would say that that population is in genetic equilibrium. So now I want to talk about the Hardy-Weinberg principle. So there are a couple parts to it, but number one, the genotypic ratios in a population are reflections of the frequencies of the alleles in a population. So for example, if the dominant allele is very, very common, the genotypic ratio um, of the homozygous dominant would be very, very high. So here are two very useful formulas, p squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals 1, and that is the mathematical equation for the genotypic frequencies, and p plus q equals 1. That is the formula for the allele frequencies. p represents the dominant allele, and q represents the recessive allele for any trait. So if you look at the genotypic frequency formula, p squared represents the genotypic frequency of the homozygous dominant genotype, the 2pq represents the genotypic frequency of the heterozygous genotype, and q squared represents the genotypic frequency of the homozygous recessive genotype. 
If you're asked on a lab or in an essay, um, what does P squared represent? Lots of students will say, oh, that represents the homozygous dominant genotype, but it represents the frequency, the genotypic frequency of the homozygous dominant genotype. So you need to be very specific. Um, the P plus Q equals one represents the idea that if you have two alleles, they are either one or the other. So if you add them up together, you get a, an allele frequency of one. So let's do some math. This is really elegant math. So here's an example of Japanese four o'clocks, which we talked about in our genetics unit. So let's just assume for the sake of argument that the dominant allele frequency is 0.75 and the recessive allele frequency is 0.25. These are not you know, real allele frequencies. They're just numbers that we came up with. But we can either plug it into the algebraic formula and take 0.75 squared plus 2 times 0.75 times 0.25 plus 0.25 squared equals 1, or we can use a Punnett square. So I like to use the Punnett square because it reinforces the idea of the laws of probability. If you have, if 75% of the alleles are dominant and you want to know the chance of getting two dominant alleles, it is the product of their individual probabilities. So 0.75 times 0.75, which is the same thing as 0.75 squared. If you want to find the chances of a heterozygous genotype in that population, you have to multiply the chance of the dominant allele by the recessive allele, 0.75 times 0.25. But remember that in your Punnett square, um, you have two squares for the heterozygous individual uh, because you can get the dominant from dad and the recessive from mom or um, the recessive from dad and the dominant from mom. So it can, you, there are two different ways that you can be heterozygous. And if you want to know the chance of inheriting both recessive alleles, you would take 0.25 times 0.25, which is the same thing as 0.25 squared. Some common mistakes that I see students make is to forget that there are two of these. So they'll multiply 0.75 times 0.25, but forget to multiply that by two or to add those two, uh, two together. A couple other common mistakes I see students do is they always assume that the dominant allele frequency is going to be the higher number, the more common allele frequency. That's not always the case. Sometimes um, the dominant allele is very rare. For example, the gene for polydactyly, which is having an extra um, digit on your hand, is a dominant allele, but it is very rare. So if we took 0.25 times 0.25, we get 0 0.0625 or 6.25%. Be very careful when doing assignments um, to read whether they're asking you for the percentage or the frequency. And it doesn't really matter, but typically leave it in decimal form unless we ask you for a percentage. The heterozygous genotypic frequency would be 0.75 times 0.25 times 2, which is 0.375. And the homozygous dominant genotypic frequency would be 0.75 times 0.75, which is 0.5625. Now students always want to know to what digit do we round. And it doesn't really matter. I always round at the very end of a problem because then your estimate is closer and, and more accurate. But as long as you leave your decimals to the nearest 100th place, so like if you rounded this to 0.56, that would be okay. I tend to go out three decimal places, but we're not worrying about significant figures um, for this type of problem. If you have already had chemistry, you know what I'm talking about. And if you haven't, you probably haven't been introduced to significant figures, but we're not worrying about um, that here. It, rounding is gonna be a little bit different depending on who's doing the problem. And remember, these are population estimates. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about, students always ask, well, are the parents both heterozygous all the time in these Punnett squares? Because they've done Punnett squares where sometimes the individual was homozygous dominant or homozygous recessive. Remember now that this is not a Punnett square for any particular um, pair of organisms breeding. This is a population estimate. 
Um, so it's a probability problem for an entire population. So this is basically allowing us to predict how common certain um, traits will be in, a, in an entire large population. All right, so um, this one is actually a, a very interesting. So if we have a homozygous recessive genotypic frequency of 0 0.04, how can we find the allele frequency? Well, before we talk about this it, mathematically, I kind of want to talk about um, eye color because it's something that you all are very familiar with. If you were in a population and you looked around and almost everyone in that population had brown eyes. And then I asked you to look at the brown eyed people and guess, are a lot of them heterozygous or are most of them homozygous dominant? I think most of you would say, well, if almost everyone in the population has brown eyes, then probably most of those brown eyed people would be homozygous dominant. Um, if you were looking at a population and there were a variety of eye colors, like there were a bunch of people that had blue eyes, then you would look at the brown eyed people and you would know that some of them would be heterozygous for eye color. So the more blue eyed people that you observe in your population, the more heterozygous individuals you would have of the dominant phenotype. So now here, if we take this number and say that the homozygous recessive genotypic frequency is 0 0.04, that's Q squared. Now, if we wanted to find the allele frequency, we would just take the square root of both sides of the equation and say that the square root of Q squared is Q and the square root of 0 0.04 is 0.2. So now we have the homozygous, um, now we have the recessive allele frequency, which is 0.2. If we have the recessive allele frequency, we can figure out the dominant allele frequency very easily because we know that if it is not recessive, it's dominant. So it will be um, P plus 0.2 equals 1 or P equals 0.8. So 1 minus 0.2 is 0.8. So we know that 20% of the alleles in the population are recessive and 80% are dominant. So let's talk about the conditions that have to be met for a population to stay in genetic equilibrium. And we call that genetic equilibrium Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. All five of these conditions would have to be met in order for no evolution to occur. The first condition that must be met for equilibrium to be reached would be random mating. So all organisms in the population would have to mate randomly. So no factors could cause organisms to choose mate it's based on phenotype or any other reason. So there are some species that mate randomly. For example, starfish release gametes into the water, but um, many birds and reptiles and, and uh, mammals, well, all of them choose a mate. So random mating really doesn't happen typically in your higher vertebrates you would have to have a large population size because if you want the laws of probability to be able to operate, you need a large population size. When you have small populations, random changes and or random chance events in the population can change allele frequencies. You can't have any mutations. As soon as you have a mutation, the allele frequency has changed because you've added a new allele into that population. You can have no migration you have to have individuals not leaving and not entering your population. Anytime individuals leave or enter your population, you're shifting the allele frequencies in that population. And you can also have no natural selection. So no alleles could have reproductive advantage or survival advantage over any others. Now you may be able to think of a trait and you know find situations where some of these five conditions are met, but it's virtually impossible for all five to be met. So under those conditions, no evolution would occur. And these conditions rarely, if ever, exist. So why do we talk about Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium if it can't happen? Well, biologists use these calculations to keep track of changes in allele frequency in a population. Um, and then they try and discover why the change is occurring. So they look for shifts and then try and figure out what's causing that shift. 
It gives, a bi it gives biologists a way to study evolution. They can try to figure out which of the five conditions are not being met. For example, does the new allele help the organisms survive and reproduce? Or are organisms entering the population or are they leaving the population? Um, so it's a jumping off point for biologists.